Amen. Thank you. Be seated.
life is found in that one word, submission. Amen? Okay, turn to First Chronicles uh, chapter 4. And I want to speak to you this morning on potters and gardeners. In First Chronicles, God has the descendants of the tribe of Judah listed. And in chapter 4, he specifies them in relationship to duties for which they're going to be held responsible. And if you go down through the list, we pick up at verses 22 and 23. First Chronicles 4, 22 and 23. And it says, And Joachim and the men of Chosiba, and Joash and Seraph, who had the dominion in Moab, and Jeshusha Lehem. These are ancient things. These were the potters and those that dwell among plants and hedges. There they dwelt with the king for his work. Verse 23 again. These were the potters and those that dwelt among plants and hedges. There they dwelt with the king for his work. So the work of a potter or a gardener would not have been considered a major enterprise in those days. And Spurgeon says it this way from June the 3rd in his uh, uh, morning and evening. He said, potters were not the very highest grade of workers. But the king needed potters, and therefore they were in royal service, although the material upon which they worked was only clay. End of quotation. Now notice the phrase, there they dwelt with the king for his work, in the passage before us. Even a small task takes on importance when it's being done for a king. And the pastor of a small out-of-the-way church actually works for the king of kings. An unknown missionary who chooses to blaze a trail that others have avoided is actually working for the king of kings. The man who drives a bus, picks up children whose parents won't take them to church, works for the king of kings. The person who vacuums the building, washes the windows, empties the trash in a church, works for the king of kings. The people who maintain the grounds of the church work for the king of kings. No task is truly a menial task if it is done to glorify the Lord through honoring his church. Spurgeon once again says this, We too may be engaged in the most menial part of the Lord's work, but it is a great privilege to do anything for the king. So not only was the potter about the work of the king, but so was the gardener. Spurgeon comments on that as well. Here's what he says. Those who dwelt among the plants and hedges, having rough, rustic hedging and ditching work to do, they may have desired to live in the city amid its life, the society and refinement, but they kept their appointed places, for they also were doing the king's work. Well, molding a clay pot is viewed differently when it is for the king, amen? Amen. And trimming the hedge is viewed differently when it is for the king. And emptying trash is viewed differently when it is for the king. So the potter and the gardener were in royal company as they carried out their assigned duties, for they dwelt with the king. So all of life takes on different perspective when we know that we're working for the king. I like to read biographies and autobiographies, and I've read about people that are non-Christians, people who are Christians, and one of the things that stands out in contrast in the biographies and autobiographies is that unsaved people focus on what they have accomplished through their own energy. And what you see in the biographies of people who followed God were submitted to Him, surrendered to His will, they talk about what has been accomplished through the power of God and the grace of God. Big difference. Every day that you and I live, we rise in the morning and we punch in for the day's duties, whatever the duties may be. Regardless of the drudgery, we're working for the King of Kings. And what a privilege it is to dwell with Jesus in daily work. So for the true believer, there is nothing in his life that is not done for the King of Kings. If he is submitted, if he is surrendered, look how the Apostle Paul viewed it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I like that word whatsoever because it means you can empty trash for the glory of God. It means you can wash windows for the glory of God. 
means you can sweep a building for the glory of God. We get the idea that the guy that stands up in front of thousands and the guy that's on TV and he's up there preaching in his $2,000 suit, that he's doing more than what any of us can do. Not according to this. Whatsoever, a word of inclusion. And the word all indicates that whatsoever I do can be motivated by honoring and glorifying God. Do you start your day off asking, what can I do today to glorify God? How can my life honor the Lord today? Well, I view my life every day as being essentially committed to the Lord to honor Him. So whatsoever I do, I want it to show others my faith, and I want it to attract them to the Lord that I serve. So what's your perspective on all that you do? I want to give some thoughts for you. And uh, <clears throat> as we serve where God places us, these thoughts are pretty important. And they're basic. Go right along with the, the song this morning. And by the way, I did not know that song was scheduled for this morning, but God did. And that's why he wanted it this morning. Number one, put glorifying God above all else. Put glorifying God above all else. One of the tragedies, I think, of modern religion is that we focused on the people in the religion rather than the purpose they should be honored, the person they should be honored. Put glorifying God above all else. 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 31, we just read, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's easy to get caught up in wanting attention to come to us. Uh, it is the pride of the old nature that seeks to steal glory from God. David realized this, and so in 1 Chronicles 16, 29, we have the collection of what's called his song of thanksgiving. It'd be good for you to read that frequently. Here's what he says in verse 29 of 1 Chronicles 16. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So sadly, I think a lot of churches today, and pastors included, are working for the glory of the flesh. And they're doing religious work in the energy of the flesh to bring attention to themselves. Well, behind the Hebrew word glory, it's the word uh, uh, kabov. It means weighing out something in order to give honor to. It deals with recognizing the Lord. Recognizing his splendor, recognize his deserving of our worship and praise. When you come to the New Testament, a different word is used, the word doxa. It's the same word from which we get the English word doxology. It carries the idea of vocalized praise and honor that's being given to the recipient. Obviously, the biblical idea of glory is associated with worship as well. So David in the song of thanksgiving, he says, give unto the Lord the glory due unto him. And then notice what he says. He says, bring before him an offering and worship him in the beauty of holiness. So he's actually saying there are two things that we should be involved in if we want to glorify God. The first is sacrifice, bring an offering, sacrifice. The second is Worship the Lord. That's surrender. You know, worship is the recognition that somebody's greater than I am. The biblical idea of worship contains both sacrifice and surrender. You can go through the Old Testament and look at every place where worship occurs, and you will find that sacrifice is there and surrender is there. Most modern worship services, as they call them, worship services are actually the worship of self. Attending a religious service is not true worship in biblical analysis. True worship includes the sacrifice of self and the surrender of self. God does not honor what we call worship when it is self-centered and arrogant. So we may be potters and gardeners, you may be involved in serving the Lord as a potter, getting your hands dirty. 
You may be a gardener, someone who's taking care of the hedges, somebody who's taking care of the grass, somebody who's digging irrigation ditches, which is what many of them did in those days. But remember, you're serving the king, and that makes all the difference. One of the greatest decisions I ever made years ago, and I was quite young when I made the decision and took somebody else's advice, <laughs> was to tell the Lord, look, I don't know what you have for me. I'm only 13 years old, 14. I said, but whatever you want me to do, here I am. You take me wherever you want to take me. Tell me to do whatever you want me to do. And I commit myself to do that. Now, put out number two. <clears throat> put pleasing God above pleasing man. Put pleasing God above pleasing man. So we work for the king of kings. We work for the one who was present at creation, was participant in it. We work for the one who came and reflected everything that he did. The father, the will of the father. He gave himself on the cross, walked out of the, the grave and embarrassed uh, Satan at graveside. And this, this is the one who's coming again at the end of the tribulation period to defeat the Antichrist and to set up a 1,000 year kingdom over which he will rule on this earth. So we work for the king of kings. We are involved in creating his pottery. We're involved in digging ditches for him and building gardens for him. Our place may not be conspicuous as some other person's place, but all of the king's servants will be judged by the king as to whether they please the king not as to whether they pleased anybody else. So it will help you a great deal to handle the unjustified criticism that other people throw at you if you'll just remember you serve the king. He's the only one you have to please. You don't have to please anybody else. Paul typifies this mentality of pleasing God. His whole life was built around that after he got saved. As a Pharisee prior to the Damascus Road experience, Paul sought to please and to fit in with the pharisaical system. He focused on all that Paul had accomplished. You go back to Philippians chapter 2 and he lists all the things that he accomplished and then he concludes the list with all of these things I counted but loss and dumb that I might win Christ. Well, then Paul met Jesus, and he would later write to the church at Galatia a principle that he lived by, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write Galatians 1.10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So in my early ministry, I sought to fit in with a particular religious group that I belonged to. In order to fit in, when I went to any kind of meeting, I had to make sure that I had been keeping this group's particular list. The only way I could fit in, keep their list. At some point, I realized I was seeking to please men, that I was spending a great deal of my time trying to do what would please other religious leaders. And I realized that I was longing to take glory for my accomplishments by simply going to these meetings and like them talking about all that we had done. Well, I'm not going to criticize that group. However, I will criticize myself. Why? For spending so many years seeking to please men. There are some attitudes, I think, which are enemies to pleasing God. And I want to give you, this is probably not all of them, but I'll give you four of them. Attitudes which are enemies to pleasing God. So here they are. Number one, the selfish attitude. Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Selfishness is the chief characteristic of operating in the old nature. The flesh is selfish. It seeks to please itself and please others if it will advance itself, but cares very little about pleasing God. But there's also a second attitude that's an enemy to pleasing God. I call this the popularity attitude. Galatians 1.10, Paul said, 
uh, for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? Because the flesh wants to be popular with men. The flesh wants to fit in. The flesh wants to seek self-glory. The popularity attitude is an enemy of uh, pleasing God. Number three, another enemy of pleasing God is the worldly attitude. The world says, walk this way. And how did they try to get you to do that? Media advertising, newspaper advertising, uh, television advertising, and now having taken over, as you saw in the thing this morning, we started looking at America's Christian Heritage on DVD. And up until uh, about 50 years ago, uh, our public schools taught true American history. Now they teach socialism in the place of American history. So they use the schools. Every dictator who has taken over a country and wanted to promote himself took over the education of children from preschool forward quickly and worked that way. Popularity, the worldly attitude. So the world said, this is the way that we want you to walk. And then God says in the Bible, this is the way walking in it. It's in the contract. And remember when Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he told them about choosing the walk that pleases God. And he was talking there about the way you live your life. The worldly attitude. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, he says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Just keep growing in this area, this attitude. And by the way, when you decide to live your life that pleases God, you will become the enemy of those who don't live their lives to please God. It's an automatic thing. Let me give you a fourth enemy to pleasing God. It's the uh, unbelieving attitude. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 says, You see, people who do not trust God respond to threats, challenges, and circumstances differently than people who do seek to please the Lord by trusting him. So we may be, we may be potters. We may be gardeners. Nobody pays attention to us. We don't hold impressive positions. However, we do work for the king of kings. So how should we face our duties? Number one, by putting, putting glorifying God above everything else. Number two, putting pleasing God above pleasing men. And these attitudes are enemies of pleasing God. Selfish attitude, popular attitude, worldly attitude, and unbelieving attitude. So... Let me give you another principle for focusing, uh, you know, on the duties that we're supposed to do in serving the king, regardless of how insignificant they may seem. This is number three. Put sacrificing for God above protecting yourself. Put sacrificing for God above protecting yourself. Um, in just a moment, we're going to be going to the book of Revelation. If you want to start turning over there, it'll be chapter 3. Uh, Christians who sacrifice for the Lord are becoming fewer and fewer. The modern church has what Jesus described as the Laodicean mentality. And Jesus warned about it in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, beginning about verse 14. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, talking about himself. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. So the modern church is lukewarm. I would thou wast cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus says, You make me want to vomit <laughs> because thou sayest 
I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. <laughs> and lest they should miss the point, he said, I'm only rebuking you because I love you. You know, modern society says that rebuke is unloving. Jesus said, no, 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 rebuke is loving. If your child's getting ready to stick uh, a screwdriver into a light socket, and you rebuke him, that's because you don't want him to electrocute himself, right? Mm -hmm. If he wants to run out and play in the road where 4,000-pound automobiles are going back and forth, and you rebuke him, that's love, right? Mm -hmm. You tell people about hell, that's rebuking them because you love them. If people are in violation of the Bible, you tell them they're in violation of the Bible. You rebuke them because you love them. You don't hate them. One of the worst things that I think is happening in our society is that if we disagree with somebody, we're, we're supposed to be unloving. We don't love them if we disagree with them. The Bible teaches the exact opposite. Put sacrificing <clears throat> for God above protecting yourself. Charles Stanley uh, frequently says this in his sermons, pastor of First Baptist Church in Atlanta. He says, the church is endangered by the desires for e ease, comfort, and pleasure. The church is endangered by the desire for ease, comfort, and pleasure. Well, the task that you and I are engaged in may seem insignificant to other people, particularly those who seek to lift themselves up by putting others down come into contact with people like that, right? However, we have to remember we walk with the king of kings. In the final analysis, he will be the judge. When it comes to entering heaven, he will be the one to say well done or not well done. And in the final analysis, he's going to be the determiner of whether or not we pleased him or tried to please someone else. And all we do, we're in the company of royalty. I serve the living king of kings. He walked out of the grave, embarrassed death, and arose to heaven to intercede for me. I'm in the company of royalty, folks, so are you. <laughs> Paul placed no limit upon his willingness to sacrifice. He wrote to the church at Philippi from prison, and he voiced his concern that there might be, during his absence, a lack of interest in the willingness of some to sacrifice. And here's what he said in Philippians 1.20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I should be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Now he's on death row. So he says, what he's actually saying here is, I might die here, but that's okay. I'm going to still be holding to the same truth of the King of Kings as I've always held to. I may get released, and if I do, I want to come back and see you again. If I get released and come back to see you, the goal will be to glorify him in my body. It's really amazing how a lot of Christians have gotten the idea that they don't have to worry about how they use their body to glorify Jesus. I worry about how I use my body to glorify Jesus. Paul was willing to give his own life if he thought was, that was how Jesus Christ was going to be glorified. Well, I am not certain today that most people who profess personal faith in Jesus Christ really have that level of commitment. So the thing we need to ask ourselves this morning at the invitation time, is that my level of commitment? I'm serving the King of Kings. I'm in royalty, and it doesn't make a difference how little my task may seem or how insignificant to other people, I've got to please him. And that's all I really care about. Well, what's your position? You need to make a change. We're going to stand together and sing the invitation, and as we do, if God's spoken to your heart, you can come. Let's stand together. Lord, we love you. And Lord, I love this church. I love these people. They've stood by you and stood by me and stood by the cause of Christ through some of the most difficult trials that a church could ever face. And we thank you 
that no matter what we're doing as we work together here, we're all serving the same royalty. We're all servants of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We thank you that you have allowed us to be privileged enough to actually work for you. So as we open the altar now, if anyone needs to deal with an issue, may this be the moment we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What page? 390. 390. God's spoken to your heart. The altar is open. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. are in authority, child is under authority, what can you do in a situation like that? And then Wednesday night, uh, what is reality? Uh, you may think what is real is real when it's not real. We'll be looking at that. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and then Paul, lead us in prayer, please. Mm -hmm. 